Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're also recording this webinar so that folks are able to watch this later if they're not able to join us. But we're so pleased that you all are here with us today. And we welcome you to um, our monthly webinar series through the American School Health Association. <clears throat> Pardon me, before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit of, with you about who we are. Who is Asha? Oh, if only I could get my slides to advance, that'd be terrific. All right. Uh, so the mission of the American School Health Association is to transform schools into places where every student learns and thrives. And we envision healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments nurtured by caring adults functioning within coordinated, <clears throat> pardon me, coordinated school and community support systems. I wanted to let you know and invite you all to join us in Cincinnati on October 2nd through the 4th uh, for our annual school health conference. Um, our call for abstracts will be opening on February 1st and we'll go through March 1st. So please consider submitting um, research that you may be working on, programs that are um, have been working for you, um, teaching and learning strategies. We would love to have you join us and we'd love to hear more about what it is that you all are doing and the difference that you're making in school health. Just a little bit about the membership benefits. Um, being a member of the, of the American School Health Association gives you access to our peer-reviewed professional journal, the Journal of School Health, or JOSH for short. Uh, we also, um, you also get access to the latest in school health through our annual conference, our bi-weekly newsletter, our networking communities, and just being engaged with those folks who are doing the work of school health every day. Uh, we also offer continuing education for um, our conferences as well as things like this webinar today, and members receive free continuing education credits. We also have an ASHA Career Center, which offers um, discount rates for job postings in our Career Center. We also have a new feature that we recently added that um, provides a place for employers to look for interns and interns, uh, prospective interns to look for internships. So please be sure to check that out. We also offer um, a 15% discount on all American Academy of Pediatrics publications. So we invite you to um, become a member and take advantage of all these wonderful benefits. So it's my pleasure to welcome today's presenter. Uh, Jill Huck is currently working as a school counselor and concussion team leader at a middle school in Westerville, Ohio. She spent 27 years as a licensed athletic trainer, 14 years as a classroom teacher, and seven years as a school counselor. Her background in both sports medicine and education contribute to her interest in this area. And we're so thrilled to have her here today to tell us a little bit more about her work and how it could apply to you. So I'll turn it over to you, Jill. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, yes, ma'am. Okay, let me, how's that? Perfect. Okay, great. So um, first, I would like to thank Asha for this opportunity. Um, if, if you haven't noticed, my, my voice sounds nervous. This is my first official webinar. Um, but I am very passionate about this topic, um, both because my background in athletic training, I've worked with a lot of athletes that have suffered concussion. And then now, as a school counselor, um, my role has shifted into that academic piece here. Um, within the school environment. Um, I would like to give a shout out to Dr. Susan Davies, who is an associate professor at the University of Dayton. I was connected with her a few years ago and ran through the pilot study um, that she did with the Ohio Department of Health. And um, she and I presented together and um, she's been willing to kind of let me 
kind of take this information and run with it. So I did want to say a little something about her. So this all kind of started in Ohio back in 2013. Um, Ohio enacted a return to play concussion law and that sort of got things rolling in terms of the student athlete and the way sports were handled. Um, so it really began to kind of set our foundation for where we have um, the program we've developed with the return to learn piece. Um, and so there were three tenets of the legislation. One included the education of our coaches, officials, parents, student athletes, and currently all student athletes in Ohio um, as a part of Ohio High School Athletic Association are required to provide kind of a, a signature that they have read and understand the concussion law in Ohio. The removal from play of a, if a concussion is reasonably suspected. This has given the officials even the power to remove the student athlete from play. And then the required clearance by a, a licensed healthcare professional so that that um, return to play um, is done safe, safely. So the reason for a return to learn. So many of these students who have sustained a concussion, including a non-athletic injury, return to school and require academic um, and environmental adjustments during that healing time for the brain. And the old school days of just kind of suck it up and um, push through, um, what we're finding with research is not not the healthiest and not what's best um, for our students. So oftentimes school personnel are not trained with the effects of a concussion, um, the ways in which to help support students transitioning back um, into learning. And so the implementation of this return to learn process with um, strategies and providing kind of this concussion team model for Ohio schools has been put in place to help improve not only the signs and symptoms of a concussion, but then how we can best support those students um, in our classrooms and in our school environments. In 2015-16, the Ohio Department of Health funded a pilot project. There were four districts in Ohio, ranging from inner city to rural, that were trained in concussion um, recognition and response. And the districts implemented the team framework. And what I'll share with you, um, one thing I think is great about this is that recognizing that every school is different and every and the personnel that a school has available to them is different. Um, this does allow for some flexibility in what your team may look like um, in that school environment. So the uh, project manager provided ongoing assistance, consultation, check-ins to just um, see what how things work best in these different school environments. Um, and then the materials were edited accordingly and there's now videos and manuals and handouts available both on the Ohio Department of Health website and also um, tools were utilized from Nationwide Children's Sports Medicine. And I have all those linked um, on this presentation. So you don't need to rush to find things or, or write things down because they're all right here in the, in the presentation. So making sure that everyone kind of understands a concussion by definition is a mild traumatic brain injury. I think when we use the term brain injury, it gets people's attention a little bit more than concussion, um, which is, is just more a more, I think, relaxed term. Um, and so the concussion is caused by a direct blow or jolt to the head, face, or neck, um, or even a blow to the body that causes the the head and brain to shift rapidly. If you think about your brain, it just sort of sits um, protected by your skull, but it has the ability to move. And so even um, if someone is shoved from behind, uh, you know, forcefully and they're not prepared for that, that can actually jolt the brain and cause the brain uh, to be bruised. So some facts that sometimes people don't realize, um, it is a, uh, the concussion re results in short-term impairment of neurological function and a constellation of symptoms. And so I, I liken concussions to snowflakes because no concussion is the same. And 
if you yourself have personally had one or you've maybe experienced or walked through this with um, your, your own child, um, their symptoms may be, be very different than the next person. And so that's really what makes this process um, sometimes very difficult. Um, they are not visible. They cannot be seen on a CT scan or an MRI. Um, when a child walks into your building with a cast on, everybody knows what's going on. But when it's a concussion and it's not something we can actually see, it becomes a little bit harder for people to kind of wrap their head around uh, the symptoms um, and then how to manage those. Um, Oftentimes, the, the number, you know, to do some statistics is difficult. Um, a lot of times people don't seek medical attention. We hear a lot from parents that, you know, their child bumped their head at soccer practice and they had a concussion all weekend, but they were feeling good on Monday, so they went ahead and sent them to school. And about 33% um, of co concussions in athletes still go unreported. So even though there's a lot more education and awareness, we still find that, that quite a few of these um, go unreported and therefore not treated appropriately. Some of the causes of, of a TBI, uh, motor vehicle accidents, um, being struck by an object, being assaulted, falling down. Um, this time of year, um, I, should, I shouldn't assume everybody's in the north where it's cold and snowy, but we get lots of kids that fall outside um, um, on the ice coming in. And so this is, th these tend to be the most common areas that we see um, as causes of TBIs. The effects of a concussion, so visibly you may see that the, um, the person is dazed or stunned, they might be confused about events, they might answer questions slowly. Um, in a school setting, I think it's important that, um, like if I'm questioning a student, I may actually go get one of their teachers because the way a child answers questions or the way they're acting might be their normal every day. And if I'm not used to that or familiar with that, um, it might make me think there's something a little bit more significantly wrong. And so that's why the team approach uh, in the school environment is really important. They may repeat questions. They might not be able to recall events that happened prior to the incident um, or right after that. Um, they may or may not lose consciousness. You do not have to be knocked unconscious to have a concussion. They may show behavior or personality changes. I will oftentimes hear from parents that like something's not right with my child because they're acting differently. And they may forget real basic things like their class schedule or an assignment, or it could just be that's something that um, is normally done um, with, that, with that student. So we look in these four areas of the effects a concussion will have. These are the typical symptoms. So cognitively, they will feel slowed down. They may have difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering new information. Physical types of things we'll see, um, headache, fuzziness, um, or, or blurred vision. Um, nausea or vomiting, usually early on, this is a symptom. This doesn't tend to happen several days later. Sensitivity to noise or light and, um, you know, the use of headphones or sunglasses um, become kind of awkward things for kids to be wearing in a school environment, but can help with those physical symptoms. Having balance problems, um, feeling tired, not having a lot of energy. Um, emotional or mood symptoms, they might be more irritable uh, than, than normal um, in middle school. That's sort of a loaded statement. Um, they may appear more sad, so they may uh, have sadness. They might be just overall more emotional or um, demonstrate a little more anxiety or higher uh, increasing anxiety or nervousness. And then sleeping, they will sleep more than usual. Um, there are times when it causes difficulty in sleeping, so this can kind of go both directions, or trouble falling asleep, just not able to really kind of let their brain um, relax enough to get them into that sleep environment. So symptoms during recovery, they, uh, symptoms will flare when the brain is asked to do more than it can tolerate. So that, um, you know, toughing it out or just continuing to work through the pain um, is oftentimes gonna make symptoms worse and it's 
typically contributes to a healing time taking a longer amount of time. Um, the treatment for, for a concussion is both physical and cognitive rest. And I will uh, provide some examples to you when we look at that. Athletes return to play, it should really mirror the return to learn process in a school. So for example, if you're hearing that a student athlete is back to practicing and back to competing, yet you are still being asked to provide academic accommodations to that student athlete, something's not lining up right. And so those two, um, those two treatments should mirror each other in that recovery process. Um, prolonged full cognitive rest may actually slow recovery as well. And so if you're just shut someone down for many days at a time where they sleep and they stay in a dark room and they're not um, doing anything physical at all, you can actually cause that recovery time to then uh, slow down. So there, there does need to be a balance here and that's where I think people get a little uncomfortable or it gets a little bit tricky because nobody wants to do something harmful um, for, for the student. So risk factors for prolonged recovery. Once a student sustains a concussion, he or she may be at a three to six times higher risk for sustaining another concussion, sometimes with less force and often with more difficult um, recovery time. Um, you may have heard that term, three strikes and you're out. Um, we now know so much more about concussions and they're studied um, uh, in depth that we are seeing where we're having middle school students that have sustained their third significant concussion and are being recommended to not participate in a sport for a number of years, take a year off, take two years off, um, just to really um, allow their brain that appropriate healing, um, full healing, because the brain is still forming um, at this age. And so um, it, is, it is something that I'm, I'm hearing a little bit more frequently. Um, the other risk factors for the developmental history in, in some extreme cases, learning disabilities, ADHD or developmental disorders, the medical history, um, is another thing of if they have a history of migraines or headaches it can contribute to that recovery process and then a psychiatric history so if they've already kind of had some anxiety depression sleep disorders um, if you think about these three areas already existing in a child that suffers a concussion it just tends to make this uh, recovery sometimes a little bit more difficult to navigate just because they have a history or have had several things going on and you're not sure. I had a football player um, a couple years ago at middle school that had a history of migraines and they would present themselves during his recu concussion recovery and it was very difficult for us to figure out, is this something that was kind of already normally happening or is this something that was, occurring now as a result of his concussion. So because every concussion and every student is different, this uh, symptom cluster and recovery rates are gonna vary. So the, the biggest message to send to your you know, administration and your concussion team and to your staff is that every student is gonna look a little bit different and there's no cookie cutter way. Um, teachers get, I, I find teachers struggle with you know, when you go and you say, we need to look at possibly exempting work or um, look at um, reducing the workload and those types of things. But then the next student, I might not ask those types of things of them and they get a little bit confused. And so it's really um, important to help them understand that the return to learn and return to play um, progression should be occurring simultaneously um, and students receiving academic adjustments um, do so because there are symptoms present. I will share with you the process that we use to collect that data and collect what those symptoms are. Um, and students who are symptomatic should not be resuming physical activity. The team approach is important. So there needs to be communication with the family, with coaches, with the athletic 
department with the athletic trainer at the school. Um, it's really important. I've even um, had opportunities where I've communicated with the actual physician to share with them what we're seeing at school so the physician can make kind of um, redo a plan or re rethink about kind of that healing process on the medical side. So when our student athlete proceeds through six steps to return, you can see here where it's from no activity, complete physical and cognitive rest, and there are six steps then where they end up back into that um, full kind of practice and game play. And so um, that return to learn and the education piece will mirror that and you will see how steps one through six we will increase um, their activity. Hi Jill, it's Caitlin. We have a couple yeah. of questions in the sure. chat box. The first one is, do we need a confirmed concussion diagnosis from a healthcare provider before providing accommodations? Um, my answer to that would be no. Um, if you have been made aware that a fall occurred and you have a student that is um, exhibiting si the concussion symptoms and sharing with you the symptoms that go along with a concussion, my feeling and our team at my school, we feel that it is our responsibility to manage them in that way. Typically, I think this happens a little bit more frequently at an elementary school um, where parents um, are in a mindset of it's kind of a bumper bruise and they'll feel better in a couple of days. In middle school, I, I see a lot more um, visits to a physician, but that doesn't always happen. Um, if I've been told that a child fell in the hall and hit their head, they were seen in the clinic, they have a headache, my school nurse is called home to report that headache and has recommended, you know, a visit to the doctor. That's, I mean, that's all we can do. Um, we can't force a family to take their child to a doctor. When that student returns to school, um, we will monitor their symptoms and provide them like physical accommodations in the school day. So maybe uh, rest in the clinic, avoiding the lunchroom for noise, um, not participating in PE. If they're telling you, if you know they fell and they're telling you they have symptoms, I feel we have a responsibility to treat the student um, as if they have that. I don't feel like we would, I, we would not say we're not, we're not treating you or we're not accommodating you because you don't have a doctor's note because not every family may have the abilities to take their child to a medical professional. Does that answer the question? Uh, I believe. It, it yes. Can get, yeah, yes, that can get. Said, yeah. Okay. Um, they said thank you as well. The next question is, how often should concussed students be completing a symptom checklist? So um, I will share an example of the checklist um, that we use. And I actually ask the students to fill it out at the beginning of every single class period um, because our students change every 54 minutes. That then allows that teacher to have immediate feedback on the physical symptoms that that student has at that time. Um, sometimes symptoms are different in the morning than they would be in the afternoon. Sometimes they're different after math class because math might be a little more exerting on the brain. Um, in an elementary setting, um, you might just set it up at beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day, just sort of monitor throughout your day. Um, but I collect it from every teacher, every period is asking the student to fill out the symptom log. Great, thank you. Okay, are, are we good, any more? That's it for now. All right, okay, thank you. Returning to school progression, so initially it's really important to get that rest um, of the brain and to get some good sleep. Um, limit their physical, emotional, or cognitive activities to a level that's tolerable and doesn't 
you know, cause their symptoms to flare um, back up. And that exertion and rest both fall on that continuum. So the continuum of no activity and full rest to full activity and no rest. Um, it's really kind of a sliding scale. It can change daily. Again, it's all dependent upon the symptoms that um, that that child is experiencing. So with our school-based concussion team, this really ensures that every student is monitored um, for that return to activity. Um, so when the health issue affects the student's learning, the school team must communicate effectively with one another, with medical personnel, and with the family. Um, the team members can listen, recognize um, fear and frustration, focus on solutions, work together towards a common goal. Um, like I said, it is a team approach. If I don't know a student personally, I will often ask teachers for feedback about their personality, about how they appear in the class environment, because that's not something that I would um, necessarily be aware of. Communicating with a coach, um, um, just it's really important that, you know, these kids don't get sort of lost and kind of fall under the radar. And so we've designed a process here that we use that I think works really well. And, and I'll share that with you. But with that being said, you know, I have a school nurse or a health aide in my building every day. Um, I am one of three school counselors. So I am the concussion team leader for all three grade levels, but I've also trained my co-counselors in the event I'm not here. This is kind of the process so that we don't, um, we don't lose track or lose, kind of fall through the cracks with those kids. So our school-based concussion teams can consist of all of these um, people, types of people, and some of you may or may not have access um, to, to them. The student and the family is at the center of this. Um, I have gotten wonderful feedback from families and parents that they had no idea that this existed. They're so appreciative that we're aware that we make our teachers aware of what's going on with the student. Um, and we ask the same of that family. Um, we ask that they support when the child is not supposed to have screen time at home or if the child is not supposed to be watching TV or, um, you know, going to an event where there's a lot of noise. So we ask them in turn to support those kind of um, rules um, in the healing process in the home environment. So our academic team, these are just some examples, teachers, school psychologists, school counselor, speech pathologists, administrators. Um, again, you may or may not have access to these people on a regular basis. Um, I know, for example, in the Columbus public school system, there is a school psychologist that oversees the entire district of concussion management. That's just what is working for, for that system. The athletic team, the coach, the athletic director, the physical education teacher, um, making sure there is uh, the ability to communicate. Um, in our middle school environment, I, I'm actually also one of the uh, co-athletic directors, and so I'm at events and I'm communicating with coaches on a regular basis, so that makes things easier for me. So making sure you know who those people are. And then your medical team is a school nurse, um, an athletic trainer, uh, a ph physician, team physician. If you're in a very real small community, there might be, you know, the local family doctor that, that helps out or that becomes kind of a part of that team. And so these are just some examples. They're, you know, by no means um, the, the final list, but this just gives you an idea of the types and the areas that you should be looking to gather uh, your team. Jill, um, uh -huh. I, I have a question and then there's another question as well that has been posed. The question that I had was related to um, the academic team and the medical team. There uh -huh. are, you know, certain requirements that we have to follow like HIPAA and FERPA. And I wondered yep. if there were, um, uh, if you had any advice for folks about how to make sure that you're sharing only the appropriate information between the two teams. Good. That's a, that's a great question. So sometimes, um, and this is where, like sometimes we get information from a physician uh, that's on a, on a document and kind of spells out everything for us. Um, we 
um, the school nurse often because she's our medical lead in the building will scan that document and share it with teachers um, our teachers when they get the packet um, there's kind of a little direction thing on the on the front of um, of kind of the process of kind of what we're needing them to do some specific accommodations and then the reminder that this information is uh, to remain confidential so it's really no different than when we provide a teacher maybe a copy of an IEP or a 504 plan um, this medical information is considered you know confidential and teachers are trusted to know the information and to and to keep that protected but um, you do need to um, you do need to kind of keep that in mind and only share the information that's necessary for so for a teacher um, receiving the classroom accommodations really kind of becomes the only part necessary they wouldn't be shared uh, any additional medical testing or any um, other types of uh, problems or issues that might have come come about in this um, another person on my team that is not listed here is my uh, attendance clerk so oftentimes she's the one that initial initiates this whole process because she gets the phone call where a student is not coming to school because they have a concussion and she's my first line of information out to a family that we have a, a concussion team that Jill Huck is works with our families um, um, getting information to the school that that is a very valuable person she receives a lot of this information um, and and understands the law and so you do you do have to be mindful of the amount of information you're getting and what you're doing with it and where you're where you're keeping it um, Thank you, Joe. I, I know yeah. it's really important information to, to keep in mind. One other thing, uh, Caroline said, recently I saw on the news that children under the age of 13 would need less brain rest time than older students. Longer rest time can actually prolong the healing time in younger students, but there was no time span given. Do you know the general time frame for complete brain rest? Um, I don't because every kid is different mm -hmm. and so typically if that younger brain heals faster you will see they have less symptoms and they're able to kind of move through that return to learn and return to play progression um, at a speed that might be found to be quicker than a, than an older student um, I like I think that's okay information, but I still treat every concussion differently. I don't say that, oh, because they're an eighth grader, I'm going to see X, Y, Z, because you never know what you're going to see on any concussion um, from a, a young child up through an adult. And so um, that might be true. The research may show that, but I still think that it's really dangerous to say, if you're working with kids under eight, this is the this is what you should see, um, or this is what you shouldn't see, because they are they are so different. Um, I think that just the best advice I can give is that if you're truly monitoring the symptoms, you're going to be able to make sure that they're they are not um, doing things they shouldn't do too quickly um, and it all becomes based on the physical symptoms that they give you the brain's only way to tell us the person um, that suffered the concussion and those of us working with that person the only way a brain can tell us it's not ready is to is to give you symptoms so the headaches the tiredness the blurred vision the inability to concentrate the sensitivity to light those those type of symptoms are telling that person i'm not ready for the amount and the load that you're you're requiring of me i need to back off or i need to kind of shut it down and and jill would you say is it fair to say that that is related to the cluster of symptoms is, is related to the area of the brain that has been injured and things like that 
Like, sure. Yeah, it can. It, you know, it, so wherever the injury occurs, it isn't, but that's the other thing. Like we don't always say, oh, they got bumped on the back of their head. So when you get bumped in the back of the head, actually your brain goes forward. And so the headache isn't usually in the, the, the pain at, at the beginning is in the back because of the bruise to the tissue, but the actual injury to the brain is in the front because the brain actually will move forward and slam into the skull in the front. And so that's the piece, you know, or that would be the area of the brain that would be likely to be affected. And so it, so that, that's why it's very difficult to say exactly what symptoms any person would have. Great. And in this case, would you recommend an IEP? No, I, no. And I will get there. <laughs> um, right, thank you. Yeah, I'll get there. All right, I'm gonna have to speed up a little bit. So when we build an academic um, team, all right, um, there you have to assign roles and responsibilities. And so you have a concussion management leader, a medical lead and an academic lead. Um, so you have two options here. One leader can manage everything and consult with a specialist in the medical and the academic area. So you'd have that concussion medical lead overseeing these two areas or the medical lead and the academic lead split responsibilities. And that's the way it happens here at my middle school. So the concussion team leader is really the central communicator. Um, and it, it can really be a lot of different people, the school nurse, a school psychologist, a counselor, administrator, or someone else. You may have another person who takes on a role in your building that would make them a really great person to be that team leader. They oversee the return to learn process. Um, they work to get releases of medical information uh, in the event there needs to be some two-way communication between the school and the healthcare provider. They need to be organized, a good communicator, willing to learn and in the building most days because you never know when these things will arise. Some suggest, suggestions where it's the same person as a 504 or IAT coordinator. Um, my building also has a success team um, teacher that works with kids that she would be really good at it. Um, so again, it needs to be um, somebody that can kind of dedicate the time. I've had years where I've, I've worked, um, you know, had, had 10 students with concussions and I've had years where I've had two. All right, hold on my little, is that better? Something popped up on my screen. All right, so our, con, um, our leader oversees uh, the process. This kind of repeats what I just said, so I'm gonna, gonna move ahead. And I'm gonna kind of take you through those steps one through six. If you remember back, we had steps one through six for that activity progression. This is that um, return to learn progression. And then I'm gonna speak to what happens in my building to give you some help. So we get notification that a student uh, has sustained a concussion and it's made to the attendance office or to the clinic. Um, this is reported to the concussion team leader. Um, and the concussion is reported um, to the medical lead and teachers as soon as possible. And so if, when I'm made aware, I immediately notify teachers and our school nurse. Um, the staff meeting at the beginning of the year, I review all of this information, um, but I also put a little cover sheet on each packet that I provide out to teachers as, as a reminder, just to let them know kind of of our process. Often, there's also times when a teacher hears from a kid they have a concussion and they'll come tell me and that's how we find out. We don't always get a phone call from a parent. Our nurse is not always notified. And so if everyone in your school building knows this process is in place, it really helps ensure that we do a really good job um, taking care of our kids. So contact is then, uh, I contact the student and the family. Um, I meet with the student upon their return. So sometimes a, a student might be out for one or two days. And so I request they come in with the parent and meet with me so I can go through the process with them. Um, I, I explain my role. I provide my contact information. I talk about 
our process. Um, I explain the responsibilities of that family um, and the student that they need to have honest communication, follow the recommendations being given, and then forward any communication notes from the physician so that we are all on the same page. Um, and then, so once I meet with that student and that family, um, a couple other things I will do. I will print off their grades. That, that way I have a snapshot at that moment of academically where that student was um, because that's harder to kind of go back and say, when was that concussion and what did their grades look like then? So I print off a schedule and their grades at that moment so I know teachers and I know grades. We have a return date for school. Um, teachers are notified. I, I get a lot of support from my administration and, and attendance in that sometimes I will actually create a schedule for a student that um, identifies a modified day. And so a student might come late, they might um, go a half day, they might go morning today and afternoon tomorrow so they can see all their classes. Sometimes you need to be creative. I really want them in their four core classes um, if we're able to get them through the, through that that amount of time. So then determining if the student has been evaluated either by an athletic trainer or physician, getting documentation. The question from earlier, would you still do this if you didn't have it? I absolutely would. You know, just like we would accommodate a, a, a kid with ADHD in a classroom knowing there doesn't have to be a medical diagnosis to know there's something going on with this kid and we need to do some things to help them. If we don't have recommendations, um, we will assess their symptoms at school um, to see if the student benefits from being in school or if attendance is counterproductive. If their symptoms are significant or severe, they really need to be sent home. There isn't any reason to stay in a school environment when their symptoms are that significant. And then if the symptoms are manageable, um, they're not getting worse, um, the students back to school, we continue on to step four. So I meet with the student upon their return. Um, I share with them the data we collect, why we collect it, um, what supports we have for them, that they can come to the clinic as needed. Um, we talk about their homework. Um, my advanced students are the most difficult to work with because they don't like to miss school and they don't like to get behind and they don't want to miss a test and they will be the ones that will really want to push through and just keep going and keep going and what i really try to emphasize is that this process is going to take longer if you don't allow your brain to heal appropriately um, so i work with attendance and i work with um, their schedule my teachers are great, and I might say, Johnny, I know you have Johnny's sixth period, but he's only going to be here in the morning, so he needs to sit in your classroom third period so he can hear science today, because otherwise he's going to miss your class. And that might mean pulling up an extra chair because there aren't any uh, left in the room, but um, like we'll do that we'll have a student go to math and language arts every day and do science and social studies every other be creative um, but when they can't be in school all day you need to figure out how they can still get some of that content so they not don't fall further and further behind um, daily breaks um, coming to the to the office with a couple friends for lunch because the commons is a super loud area um, recognizing that they're behind on their assignments, doing a, a schedule, planning out uh, assignments, helping them see that so they don't realize that they have to do it all at one time. Uh, they really shouldn't take more than one test or quiz a day um, if they're back um, to that level. Um, and then that classroom symptom log. So if there are academic recommendations from the healthcare provider, sometimes you'll get that. Oftentimes I do not. Um, it's very vague on what we're supposed to do. Um, and so this sheet here, I'm going to go through this and show you. This is our um, assessment form. Um, so I make packets for teachers. I make sure they have five days worth of um, forms. 
and I put a cover page on it reminding the, them about symptoms and about any other academic accommodations. And then uh, those classroom assessment forms, I ask them to turn those into me every day so I can see a little snapshot of how that student was able to physically get through the day. So the student will fill this out. This is an example. Um, there, what I love about this is that there are instructions for the students and there's instructions for the educator. So a teacher is given immediate feedback on how to best support that student in their classroom that period. Um, this section here, you have these symptoms. If the student is indicating any of these are severe, they need to be removed from your room, go to the clinic, and oftentimes we send them home. There's no reason for this student to be in school if these symptoms, if any of these are indicated as severe, they're not ready to be in that environment. All right, so that's kind of the first set of, of symptoms we look at. The second set, here's our list of symptoms, and then depending on if the student says yes or no, teachers are provided an immediate feedback of what they can do in their classroom to help support that student. Um, and these you know, can be very easy to do, um, but I think our teachers feel supported in that they know right away what, what they can do um, that class period. Again, these symptoms might actually be different from period to period. The most common thing down here, what tasks in school are most difficult? Concentrating. A lot of students will indicate I'm having trouble concentrating or I'm having trouble focusing and that's that's a pretty common one. So I will give updates or changes in writing to my teachers. Um, I contact the family or a coach or athletic trainer um, if with relevant academic or medical updates if there's needed. If I'm finding that you know, a student just can't physically get through the day and it's a prolonged type of thing, we might say, you know what, you might need to go back to the doctor earlier. You might need to gain some medical um, attention, um, you know, sooner than, than later. Um, so I maintain that documentation. Um, I continue, I look at the symptoms, I adjust the plan as necessary. I meet weekly with the student about their progress in school. When is their next doctor's appointment? Um, are they back doing physical activity with their team? Because like I said, those two processes should mirror each other. Have there been a change in symptoms? Um, you know, I gain teacher and uh, parent feedback. And then once the physician follow-up appointment stop, like they've been cleared, that in our return to play progression is completed, they're not having symptoms at school, they're caught up with their work. I do bi-weekly checks for a month. So I'll check in with them every couple of weeks for a month just to make sure the academic piece is on target and they're not uh, having any other kind of symptoms at school. And so you reassess the medical or academic leads at step three or four or if any of these things happen. So if a new physician documentation arrives, it might change the plans. Um, so we've been given kind of a new directive. Their symptoms change, so they had a, two or three really good days at school, and then all of a sudden they're back to having some more severe symptoms, so we might need to um, adjust what we're doing. Um, symptoms have resolved, are no longer a barrier to school participation. Believe it or not, I had a student um, with a bike accident, had a skull fracture, and within one week was completely symptom free and was caught up in school and there were zero issues. That I found hard to believe, but um, that was, was an experience that I had. Um, or if teachers or parents identify problems in the plan that are not being addressed. So the teacher that is really not um, reducing load or giving the, the time that, that the student needs, um, being absent from school or being academically accommodated does provide that student additional time or extra time. And you might need to walk through that with a teacher. Some are willing to die on that hill um, and I offer to hold their hand or we can work together as a team and come up with a way 
to get this assignment completed by the by the student. Um, all right, so I'm have about let's see five or six minutes. I want to make sure I cover. Um, so when we look at our symptoms, this is a really great rule of thumb. So you kind of pick one thing to increase at a time. So you either increase the amount of work, the length of time spent on the work, or the type or difficulty of work. Um, keeping in mind that all of these things are potentially using different parts of the brain, and so you can't kind of cram it all in at, at one time. And so as symptoms improve, we just kind of increase the amounts um, to, to give the brain a little push and to see how that brain's gonna respond. Here's my um, reminder about privacy, um, remembering to keep the student information um, as private as possible, discuss only what's necessary, um, discuss only situations where you can't be you know, overheard or things can't be shared, only email if it's appropriate, uh, least secured, and follow your school's guidelines. Each school district may have specific guidelines here that might might add to the process or this process within within your school. Um, making sure that all your staff has been educated about concussions, how they do affect learning, um, emphasize the reason that this is necessary, uh, provide more specific training. It's real. Um, it's frustrating to hear when a, when a parent says, well, my older child experienced a concussion and didn't receive any of this help uh, in their school. And in high schools, I think when our school counselors have caseloads in my district, over 400, um, and there's no specific person that wants to take this on, oftentimes this, this kind of gets lost in the shuffle. So it's really important that uh, someone is identified to kind of be the lead and to make sure that um, your staff is educated and that you provide some professional development or provide some information to um, all, all the members of your, of your school staff to help those students. So that academic progression, as you'll see here, goes from full rest to a full day of school, um, giving those accommodations along the way. Um, increasing demand, symptoms increase or there's no change. This is a really great flow chart to kind of tell you what you need to do next. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna run out of time. So I wanna get to a couple, um, a couple things here that have been difficult. I guess for my teachers, just being able to identify and excuse assignment assignments that are they're accountable for um, the timelines on those um, this creates a lot of anxiety for students they don't like to fall behind um, it does not create anxiety for the students that are might think this is great because they don't have to do work and so that's a balance you have to kind of figure out um, are kids going to lie about their symptoms to get out of work they absolutely are I'm not willing to lose my license over figuring out a student that's not gonna tell me the truth. And so when we don't think a student's being completely honest, we try to have more conversation about the importance of being honest and, and the importance of what we're trying to do for them and, and to kind of see this through. Um, the, the general things, the class environment, the noise levels, those type of things, I think one piece, that I really wanna hit on before I run out of time is this emotional piece. Because if you think about a student athlete and they have sustained a concussion, so you've taken away their sport, they're not allowed to go to school, so now you've taken away their social uh, interaction with friends, um, they might really enjoy school or be, be real conscientious about their grades and now we're taking that away. We're taking away a lot of really important things to adolescents and, and that can be devastating for them. So working to maintain social connections with students, um, I think is really important. I like when I create a school day that's altered for a student, that it count, that lunch is a part of that so they can come to the office and hang out with their friends and communicate with friends. Um, keep, 
I just think this piece sometimes gets overlooked um, and that when the, everything's been taken away from them, we really need to be mindful of being able to support the student emotionally as they go through this um, because they're in a really, you know, middle school and high school can be tricky when it comes to that, to the social parts. Um, see, I talk way too much. Uh, my take home messages, this is where we'll end. No, no two concussions are the same. Um, so you really have to be willing to treat these differently. Um, education, educators still need to be educated about how to manage these. Um, they are different. It does, it's a little bit of a learning curve. Communication is super important, making sure everyone in your school knows who you are, knows the role you're taking um, in this management. The family is, is communicated with as well. I've had nothing but positive feedback from families about being appreciative that somebody at school is aware and is caring about their student. And then some of the resources that I've indicated here, the Ohio Department of Health, all of this stuff I talk about, all of these handouts, all of this process is available to you online. It's not a secret. Don't go out and reinvent the wheel. Utilize some of these tools and resources. Um, Nationwide Children's has things you can give your teachers, you can give your uh, administrators, things you can pass out to parents. So th this is a really great tool as well. All right, I think, I think I'm on the button here. I don't. I don't want to mess up the process. No worry. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jill. This has been amazing. And I really appreciate the amount of depth that you gave us and all the resources. And we've yeah. been kind of populating things within the, the chat box. So if uh, okay. people are looking for some things, um, there are some things there as well. Great. Um, let me go here really quickly and just, I want to make sure sure um everyone sorry sorry okay. there was a question someone asked about uh symptoms that seem to be taking too long okay. they saw the slide so yeah um so if you know the symptoms are prolonged typically so in sports medicine world typically when a concussion um comes in and is being managed it's monitored every week or every two weeks and usually when the symptoms are not resolving around that six week mark, um, usually the medical professionals will be sending them out for additional testing, maybe to a neurologist or um, sometimes to a psychologist, um, depending on, on what's going on. So typically at that six to eight week mark, that's where you'll see additional medical testing that gets involved. Um, usually, because I know the IEP 504 thing comes up. There are some districts that want to put a student on a 504 as soon as a concussion comes in. Um, our district does not work that way. Um, concussions are, or, I'm sorry, 504s are supposed to be for something that's prolonged. And so if we have a student that's getting out to that, um, let's say eight to 10 week mark, they're still having symptoms, they're, fall, they're struggling in school, We we are going to get our, our, our um, IAT team, our success team together and really start diving in and looking at that student's academic piece. Um, there are cases where the concussion um, causes something that's already been going on with the student to really be um, brought to light or to be um, exaggerated to some degree. And so there have been cases where a student has some difficulty. Um, if they've been in a car accident, sustained a traumatic brain injury, there could be brain damage. And so therefore a student might need to be on an IEP and have specialized instructions based on the damage that was done to their brain. And so the, you can't say that they'll never be on those or they shouldn't be, or does the concussion cause that? Typically, if they're not resolved in that six to eight week window and they're being referred on to additional medical testing, your school should be putting, moving this child to like the IAT or RTI or whatever your process is called in your school to begin monitoring that student and their educational piece to see if something does need to be put in place. Terrific. Thank you so much. And I know there, there are some other questions that we've gotten in the chat box, but unfortunately we've run out of time. 
And I wanted to just let you all know about some upcoming webinars that we have coming. So please mark your calendar. Feel free to check the um, ashaweb.org for any upcoming webinars there as well. Um, just as a reminder, this, um, this webinar is eligible for CHES, MCHES, and CNE for nurses as well as a participation um, if you need that for um, other types of certifications um, or licensure. Uh, Caitlin is going to put in the chat box the link to the um, evaluation so you can receive that. Um, for ASHA members, that is free to you. Um, for non-members, that's $30. And uh, just take a moment to fill that out. And uh, we hope to see you in Cincinnati. And we want to thank Jill so much for all the great information today. I think we could have talked about it for two more hours. So I know. I, it's a lot. It's it, I mean, there, there's a lot of resources out there. I encourage you to use them. Um, you know, I email me if you have a specific question. I'd be happy to help you. Um, it's not, um, somebody just sort of has to, to take an interest in doing this. I think it's important that every school has this process. Um, so my, I just am passionate about getting the word out and, um, doing what I can to help teachers because everyone's job is hard enough <laughs> without right. one more thing. Right. Yeah. Well, we appreciate all your hard work and thank you so much for sharing today. And I wish everybody a safe and warm evening. Everybody stay, stay warm. All right. Thanks for joining <laughs> us, everyone.